Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Breeds. I have a fun bookish tag video to do for you today. It is the book recommendations tag. I stumbled upon this recently. It was originally done by Lauren Sidney, but I believe that she got the idea from an Instagram follower of her. So I don't actually know where the originator of these questions came from, but I will be sure to leave Lauren Sidney's video down below for you. I just thought that this would be a really fun way to provide y'all with some book recommendations. Now, a lot of the books that I'm going to be talking about today are books that I've probably talked on my channel multiple times at this point, but I still thought that this would be a fun, quick way to recommend some books for you. Question number one is a book that you tell people is your favorite. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is going to come as no surprise to anybody, but I love this book with my whole heart and soul. Anytime somebody asks what my favorite book is, this is it. I'm going to try not to use this book as an answer for every single question because I want to definitely do some variety and like I said, give additional recommendations, but this book just means the absolute world to me. From the way that it was beautifully written to the actual story itself, to the characters and the way that they just jumped on the page. This book was phenomenal and it deserves absolutely all of the hype that it gets. And I just feel so blessed and grateful all of the time that this book exists and that I've read it and that I've loved it so much. This was my introduction into Taylor Jenkins Reid, who is now one of my favorite authors of all time. I was just astonished by the beauty of this story. If you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Evelyn Hugo, who was a big movie star back in the old classic days of Hollywood. Now she is aging and she is very reclusive, but she is finally ready to tell her story. And she is giving her story to a woman named Monique. And this is a surprise to everyone, especially Monique, because she's a journalist, but she's not a very well-known journalist. And so she has no idea how Evelyn Hugo knows who she is. She has no idea why Evelyn Hugo is giving her the story, but you're following Evelyn as she is telling her story to Monique. And so you're diving back in time to the glamorous days of old Hollywood. And it just follows Evelyn's journey, how she was discovered and the tumultuous nature of her career and the things that she had to do to be successful as a woman in old Hollywood and be respected and things of that nature. And she was not afraid to go do what she had to do to get to the top. She was not always the most likable character that made her a very complex and dynamic character in my opinion, but just the overall story of this was just breathtaking. I loved absolutely everything about it. By the time this book ended, I felt like I could go and watch Evelyn Hugo's movies and I was sobbing by the end of the story. If you've read it, you probably know why, but I was absolutely sobbing because I was so connected to the characters within this story. And it just killed me that Evelyn Hugo had lived such a vibrant life. And then she's kind of in a place where she is now all alone for various reasons that you find out throughout this story. And you just can feel that emptiness and that loneliness. So this book broke my heart in all of the best and worst ways. And I cannot, cannot recommend it enough. Question number two is a book that is your guilty pleasure. And I don't necessarily know if I have an answer to this because I don't believe in guilty pleasure books. I don't think you should feel guilty for any of the books that you read. I think the instinctual answer for this for me and probably a lot of other people would be just like smut. Know what I mean? Just romances with a bare chested man on the cover where there's very little plot. It's all smut. It's basically porn in a book. But I still don't think that that's worthy of being called a guilty pleasure because there is a huge market for that. A lot of people read those books and it's still reading. No matter what you're reading, it is still reading. Whatever gives you enjoyment and whatever gets you to pick up those books, I think is worthwhile. So I'm going to cop out. I'm not going to give an answer to this question because I don't really believe in guilty pleasure books. Question number three is a book that everyone loved that you didn't. And I'm actually going to give a recent read to this answer. And that is Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren. Recently did a vlog where I read romance books that were very popular in the online bookish community. And Love in Other Words was recommended to me more than once when I was looking for suggestions. And I know that it is very much one of the more popular and highly praised Christina Lauren books. So I was expected to go in here and have this be my favorite Christina Lauren. It just did not work out for me. And I think part of that, here's a caveat. I think part of that is because I read it on the heels of Every Summer After by Carly Fortune. And the two books have overall kind of similar premises. And as soon as I jumped into Love in Other Words from Every Summer After, I could just tell how inferior Love in Other Words was in terms of writing and complexity and depth, character development, everything like that. Every Summer After did it so much better in my opinion. And so when I was reading Love in Other Words, I could just feel that difference. Friends. If you're not familiar, Love in Other Words is a childhood friends to lovers to heartbreak second chance romance, you know, where you're following these kids as they become friends and they develop into something more and they have this really passionate and intense relationship. And then something extremely dramatic happens that tears them apart and breaks them up. And then they've gone like a decade without seeing each other. And now something reunites them in the future. And they're having to kind of relive everything that happened in the past and work through it to build a relationship back again. I just feel like a lot of the choices that that book made were horrific and cringy and eye rolly. And I didn't start to really like and connect with this book until I was about 70-75% of the way in. Some of the things that happened in this book were just worthy of the biggest eye rolls of life. So unfortunately I don't agree with the online bookish community in this one. I did not love Love in Other Words and I think if you're looking for this type of story you need to read every summer after. So that's my opinion. Question number four is a book that you read the fastest. For this I'm going to select The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. This is always the book that I think of when I think of a binge-worthy book because I sat down and flew through this in less than 24 hours because I absolutely 
absolutely had to know what happened. This is a paranormal suspense thriller that follows two different timelines. In the present day timeline, you're following Carly and she knows that way back in the early 80s, before she was even born, her aunt Viv disappeared. She was working as the overnight clerk at the Sundown Motel and something happened and she was never seen or heard from again. And Carly's mother, who was Viv's sister, never knew what happened to her sister. And now Carly's mother is dead and Carly is taking it upon herself to find out what happened to Viv. So she actually goes and gets basically the same job at the Sundown Motel. And you quickly find out that the Sundown Motel is not like any other hotel because there are ghosts involved at this hotel. I love the way that Simone St. James utilized ghosts in this story. They were there, they were a thing. They weren't really questioned. And then of course you're getting the timeline from the early 1980s when you're following Viv and what actually happened to her. I just tore through this. I ate this up. The atmosphere in this was chef's kiss perfection. I just had to know what happened, had to keep turning those pages. And this is 100% a bingeable book, but it's also solid substantial storytelling. It's not necessarily like a popcorn read that you're going to fly through and probably forget about immediately. So highly recommend this one. Question number five is a book that deserves more hype. So I'm going to talk about two because they are very, very different, but I don't really hear anybody talk about these books. The first one is one that you've actually heard me talk about quite frequently on my channel, A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. I think that I've mentioned this in probably like six or seven videos prior. I just love the story. It is a wintry isolation thriller that follows a naturalist who moves out to Montana to study wolverines. She's on this very isolated former ski resort kind of lodge area that's been turned into a nature preserve. She's all alone out there and she starts to notice some sinister things out there and those things start coming for her and it becomes about survival not just for her but there are some other lives at stake in here. It's very high stakes in my opinion and for the like the last two hours of the audiobook I was just like gripping my seat. I just wanted to know what happened. I didn't want to do anything else. I was nervous. I was anxious going through this and I think that's the sign of a really brilliant thriller and I don't hear nearly anybody talk about this. In fact I don't think I've heard one person talk about this but I would say that it's probably up there along with No Exit as my favorite wintry isolation read. If you like that subgenre in thrillers I cannot recommend this enough. I also want to talk about One to Watch by Kate Stamen Linden because this is a contemporary that blew me away and gave me five stars not just because of the overall writing and the plots and the characters but some of the amazing messages on body positivity that are in this story. So this follows our main character B. Schumacher and she's a pretty successful online fashion blogger and she's a big fan of this reality TV show that is very much like The Bachelor and but she is frustrated by the lack of diversity and representation on this show. Like there are no fat bachelors or bachelorettes on this show basically and she goes onto Twitter to her following and calls them out and she's very surprised when for the next round of the show she is called to be basically The Bachelorette. It's all about her experiences, what she experiences as a plus size main character and some of the shame that she feels and some of the hate that she gets from some of the men that she's supposed to date on this show. There's just so much amazing commentary on the fact that we feel as a public that we have the right to deserve and comment on others' bodies, the unrealistic beauty expectations, and what actually makes beauty versus what doesn't make beauty. Like, why do we think one way is beautiful and one way is not beautiful? I just felt like some of the messages in here were so, so strong. And I wrote a very lengthy, articulate review on this book on my Goodreads. And so if this sounds like something that you might be interested in and you want to hear more of my in-depth thoughts, please feel free to go ahead and check out my Goodreads. But I'm really proud of that review. And I just was really overall proud of this book. And like I said, I wasn't expecting to love this book as much as I did. I did not expect this to be a five-star read for me, but it was absolutely. I just loved B overall as a character. She was very strong, very intelligent, very articulate. And I just sympathized with her, empathized with her. I couldn't believe some of the scenarios that happened in this book. Just, I love this, everything about this story. And I don't hear nearly enough people talk about it. Question number six is a book that is becoming a movie or TV show. By the time that this video goes live, Daisy Jones and the Six will have already premiered. That is probably my most highly anticipated adaptation for 2023. It's a Taylor Jenkins Reid story, as you know. So I'm going to mention that here because that is definitely one that I would have mentioned previously. But since it's already out, I'm going to go with another Taylor Jenkins Reid adaptation coming out. And that is One True Loves. It is coming out in April, I believe. I believe it's only going to be released in select theaters and then it's going straight to streaming. So this is actually one of Taylor Jenkins Reid's contemporaries. If you're not familiar, she wrote a handful of contemporaries a few years ago that were her first book. And her newer releases are more historical in nature. And her newer releases are all kind of more historical in nature. And they all kind of have strings of characters in common. So they're all kind of set in this little world. This is the only contemporary that I read from her thus far. And I did love One True Loves. This is a love triangle that was done so remarkably well. And it was not a traditional love triangle. It follows our main character, Emma, who married her high school sweetheart, Jesse, in her early 20s. And they're just madly in love. They're building a wonderful life with each other. And Jesse is some type of, I think he's a journalist, maybe a documentary maker. He is actually on assignment one day when his helicopter goes down and he's basically presumed dead. And naturally, Emma is just devastated beyond comprehension. And she has to learn how to live in a world without Jesse. And so she goes through her grieving and her mourning period. And then one day, Emma runs into Sam, who is an old friend of hers, and they start falling in love and they build their own very passionate and intense loving relationship. And they are engaged and they are going to be married. And then one day, 
Emma gets a phone call she never expected to hear and that is Jesse and that he has been found and he is alive. And so you have Emma with Sam who she truly loves dearly. Sam is not a rebound. Sam is not a second choice. Sam is somebody who Emma deeply loves and wants to be with for the rest of her life. But now her high school sweetheart, the one that she did think she was going to be with for the rest of her life is back in her life. And she's going to have to kind of make a decision about who she wants to be with at this point. I just thought that this was so, so well done because this is a love triangle where I feel like the love for both characters is deeply real and deeply apparent. I feel like in typical love triangles, there's always one of the love interests that gets the shaft. Like you're always focused more on one than the other. And you know that that one is going to be the one that's chosen. I don't really feel like that happened in here. You legitimately don't necessarily know who Emma is going to choose. And I think this is also a really great depiction on grief and how it changes you. The Emma with Sam is not the Emma that she was with Jesse. And that really is a whole big part of the story. And I just love the whole execution of this. And this is coming out, like I said, in April. I'm excited to see what the adaptation is like. I've seen the trailer and I just ugh, gave me some feels. So I'm definitely looking forward to this one. Number seven is a book that you reread the most. And this is another question that I just don't have an answer to because I am not a rereader. I find the joy of reading the book is following the journey and getting to the end. And once I know the journey and once I know the end, I don't typically have the urge to reread it. It is something that I actually don't want to waste my time doing because there are so many other new books out there that I want to read. And so rereading is just really not a priority for me. I know that that's probably an unusual or an unpopular opinion for a book nerd, but rereading is just, is just not something that I do. It's not really something that I want to do either. Question number eight is a book from a genre that you don't typically read. And for this, I'm going to choose All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood. Not only is this from a genre I don't typically read, which is like a literary fiction, but the subject matter in here is also something that I don't typically read. This is following a very unconventional relationship to say the least. This follows our main character, Wavy, from the time that she is about six years old. She is the daughter of a drug dealer. She's from a very, very dysfunctional household to say the least. And from a very young age, I believe by like eight years old, she's in charge of her baby brother. She is kind of like the adult in this household. Her mother is basically useless. Like I said, her dad is a drug dealer. He is a very dangerous man. And then one day Wavy helps one of her dad henchmen, if you will, Kellen, who has wrecked his motorcycle and Wavy is there. And that starts the relationship between Wavy and Kellen. And Kellen at the start of this book is in his early 20s and she is eight. Now at the beginning of this book, it's very much more like a father-daughter kind of relationship because Kellen realizes that Wavy is not being taken care of. And he takes it upon himself to make sure that she is. But then she starts getting into her teens, very early teens, 14 years old, mind you. And that's when things kind of start ramping up into something more sexual. And I know what you're thinking. You're very cringy. You don't know if you could handle this type of material, but I cannot even express to you how beautiful this book was and how well the subject was covered. There is no shying away from the fact that Kellen is in his 20s and he is with a girl that is 14 and everything that goes along with that. But you do know that Kellen is a good man and you actually do root for him and Wavy. It was just such a stunning, stunning, stunning book and I recommend this. Even if you feel like this might not be something you would normally read, still recommend picking this up because it wasn't something I normally would have read either and it knocked me off my feet. Question number nine, a book that deserves all the hype it gets. Okay, okay, okay. I'll make a different selection. So for this, I think I want to talk about Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. This is another one that I mentioned a few times on my channel. This is following our main character, Tova Sullivan, who actually works as a janitorial service overnight at a local aquarium and the bond that she forms with Marcellus, a giant Pacific octopus. And Tova is kind of on her own because her husband and son are both dead and gone. She is, I believe, in her 60s or 70s at this point. And so she's just trying to get through life, make it through her days. And it's because she's on her own. It's because of the loneliness that she takes this job as a janitor at the aquarium. Aquarium. You follow her as she starts to build a relationship with Marcellus, who as a giant Pacific octopus is obviously a remarkably bright creature and he understands Tova and he gets to know her and appreciate her and trust her. And you actually get Marcellus's perspective in here, which was fantastic. He is a fantastic character. So you're getting to see his own perception of Tova and just humanity in general and some of his observations from living life in a tank in the aquarium. There's also an additional character in here and I don't really want to say much about him because he's not even mentioned in the dust jacket for this. Like when you go into this book, you think it's literally only about Tova and Marcellus, but that's not the case. There's another very prominent character in here and I don't want to say anything because really you need to follow the journey and you need to follow the journey about how this character actually connects to Tova in the end. That was probably one of my favorite parts about this whole book because at first I wasn't necessarily like emotionally connecting to it and I didn't care about this other character. I wanted Tova and I wanted Marcellus and I still think one of my biggest complaints about this story is that Marcellus is not featured more. He's more of a side character, which isn't what I was wanting or expecting. So I didn't really understand where this other character came in, but by the end of it, when you see how 
it all kind of weaves together. It was just so beautiful and touching and heartwarming and I loved it. And I'm absolutely going to keep my eye out for more Shelby Van Pelt in the future because I just thought that this was wonderful. And I think it really deserves all of the hype that it's getting, to be honest. And you get a lot of the feels that you think that you're gonna get when you go into this. Question number 10 is a book you usually recommend when asked to give a recommendation. And that's obviously going to depend on the recommendation that they're looking for. Like, I'm not just gonna recommend a random book that they may have no interest in based on genre, but just in general, um, one of the authors that I recommend frequently to anybody is Kristen Hanna. And so I will go ahead and talk about The Great Alone, which is probably one of my favorite books by her. But literally every single book that I read is absolutely phenomenal. She, like Taylor Jenkins Reid, just puts so much thought and energy into the character development in these stories. Like they feel real and you connect to them so greatly. There's also a lot of research that goes into Kristen Hanna's books and you can feel that. And Kristen Hanna is another one that does atmosphere very well, especially in this book, because this is set in Alaska. And you could just feel the desperation, the isolation, the cold, all of it that goes along in here. And you could also feel the fear and the terror specifically in here because this follows a family, a husband, a wife, and their daughter. But the husband has PTSD. He is a Vietnam veteran. He has returned from the war. He's a very different man, a very changed man. And he takes out his anger on his wife and his child. And you can just feel how that fear is compounded by their isolation in Alaska. This was just so beautiful. It was harrowing. It's historical fiction, but it's not yet as quite historical fiction as some of her other stories. And it's not centered around a war. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like or based historical fiction like I do. But if you do, of course, I'm going to recommend The Nightingale by her, which is World War II historical fiction. And that is one of the best World War II historical fictions I've ever read. You really cannot go wrong with Kristen Hanna. She also has a lot of books that are slightly older, but are more on the contemporary side, but they all have harder hitting elements. They always have very dynamic and complex characters that are working through some stuff. Just know that you're in for a really intense reading experience. She is a literary heartbreaker. She's known for that for a reason. You will likely end up crying at the end of a book of hers. Question number 11 is a book that has your favorite favorite characters. And I'm probably going to say the A Court of Thorns and Roses series by Sarah J. Mass, particularly starting with A Court of Mist and Fury. This is when you are really introduced to the inner circle. The inner circle are my favorite characters. But to be honest with you, probably every single series by Sarah J. Mass has my favorite characters in it. Definitely, definitely the inner circle in the A Court of Thorns and Roses series. They're probably some of my favorite characters of all time. Question number 12, a book you wish you could live in. And yeah, I'm probably going to be basic here and say Harry Potter. That's always going to be the default answer to this question. Yes, I wish that I had gone to Hogwarts. Yes, I wish I had gotten my letter. Yes, I wish that I could be there to know Dumbledore and McGonagall and Snape and all of the wonderful characters that I grew up with and have been such an important part of my life. So I will 100% say Harry Potter for this one. No shame. Question number 13 is a book you thought you would hate but ended up loving. And I actually have another recent read that I want to use to answer this question. The Sweet Spot by Amy Popol. So this was the very first book that I received from Aardvark Book Club. This was the only one out of all of their selections that sounded even remotely like it could be something that I would enjoy. But I was very skeptical. I was very hesitant. And the only reason why I ended up purchasing it and getting the box for February was because I wanted to do a video comparing Aardvark with Book of the Month. And I couldn't do that without having made a selection. And luckily I was able to read this before I even did that video. And this ended up being such a wonderful surprise that I was not expecting to enjoy nearly as much as I did. This is basically a comedy of errors and what happens when three very different women who are all connected by one specific circumstance, one specific thing, end up taking care of a baby that is not theirs and how they all have to come together to take care of this child, what they learn from the experience, how they come to grow and love one another, and all of the other zany characters that are supporting in here that are fantastic. The audiobook actually has a full cast of characters, so any different perspective in here has their own narrator, and I just loved it. I just thought that it was so wonderful and quirky, and you can't just help but love pretty much every single character that is in this story. So this is one that I'm now actually very, very glad that I selected. I'm very glad that I read it and enjoyed it, and I'm absolutely going to be keeping my eye on Amy Popol in the future because I had never heard of her as an author before before, but I will absolutely be reading more from her in the future because of the sweet spot. Question number 14 is a book that made you cry. A story that I haven't mentioned too frequently on my channel, but definitely, definitely made me cry. The Storyteller by Jodi Picoult. This is another solid World War II historical fiction. This is probably one of the best World War II historical fictions I have ever read. This follows our main character, Sage. She is a baker. She loves the process of baking. She finds it very therapeutic. And it's about her relationship with a man named Joseph Weber, who frequents her bakery, but also is part of a grief group that she is a part of. Sage lost her mother in a tragic accident and it is the same tragic accident that kind of gave Sage a disfiguring scar across her face. And so Sage is working through a lot of grief and trauma and she strikes up this friendship with Joseph, a very elderly man, until one day Joseph makes a very, very startling confession to her and he says that he was a Nazi in Germany, World War II, and that he did a lot of horrific things. And not only that, but he has a request of Sage. And I'm not going to tell you what that request is, but it's a pretty intense request. And Sage is horrified by the request, by the fact that this sweet, kind old man was a vicious Nazi and she
she is also disgusted because her grandmother was a victim of World War II. She was in concentration camps and what that put her through. She's trying to deal with all of the motions that are coming up, not just from learning who this man is, but what this man wants her to do. And then you're also getting flashbacks to her grandmother's time in the concentration camps. I just remembered sobbing at the end of the story because there was a twist that I didn't see coming. And when the twist came around, it just broke me. I could not believe what I was reading. I was just, I was just sobbing by the twist. And also just what this man wants Sage to do for him. It was astonishing. It was heart-wrenching. It was raw. I just love this story. I think this is one of Jodi Picot's strongest stories. So if you are a fan of Jodi Picot and you've never read this, highly, highly recommend. It was a beautiful, beautiful story. And then question number 15 is a book that you could read for the first time. And I am absolutely going to go with The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. This is one that I feel like I could experience again for the very, very first time and relive all the emotions. One of the reasons why I haven't reread this this is not because I don't think I'm going to love the story again, but I don't think that even if I were to reread it, I could never capture the original emotions that I had because I already know everything that's coming. I already know what Evelyn Hugo went through. I already know the conclusion to the story. So nothing is going to grip me as hard emotionally. And that's basically one of the reasons that I have not reread this is because I just know that no matter how much I love it upon reread, it's still not going to hit me the same way that it did the very first time. And so that's why I really wish that I could experience this again for the first time because I want to feel all of those emotions. I want to meet Evelyn Hugo again. I want to go through her story. I want to meet the husbands that she married. I want to experience that all again. I want to live Evelyn Hugo's life again with her. And I wish that I could do that with fresh eyes from the very first time. I am jealous of everybody who is reading this from the very first time because it is just such an astonishing journey. And like I said, broke my heart in two at the end. Sobbing mess by the end of this. Ugly crying. So this is the one, hands down, that I would love to be able to read for the first time with fresh eyes. All right, y'all, that is it. That is the book recommendations tag that actually went on a little bit longer than I thought it would. That's like the story of my life in the story of my channel. That went on a little bit longer than I thought because I cannot stop talking. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking now. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and there's a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.